Chapter 10 of Quest of the Golden Ape by Randall Garrett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Quest of the Golden Ape. Chapter 10 The Road to Nadia. The stads of Abaria, like the masters who rode them, were ill accustomed to the clear, cold air of Nadia. They snorted visible jets of vapor into the crisp air as their splayed feet scratched and slipped, seeking purchase on the ice-covered, up-tilted, rocky plain. "'It's an accursed country, lord,' Hultux told the king of the Iberians as their steeds advanced shoulder to shoulder. Retox sat stalled and straight on the stad's broad back, his black cloak with the royal emblem billowing in the stiff wind his hard, handsome face ruddy with the cold air, his cruel eyes mere slits against the Nadian wind. "'Quiet, you fool,' he admonished Hultax. "'Everything we Iberians say and do in Nadia must be sweetness and light, now.' The vanguard of the long column of Iberian raiders had reached a rushing mountain stream, its waters too swift to freeze in the sub-zero temperature." Lifting one hand overhead, Retok called a halt. "'They'll find out, Lord,' Hultax persisted. "'They'll find out what you did. I know they will. They'll find out it was you who killed Jlomek, their ruler's brother.' Retok smiled. The smile made Hultax's blood run cold, for he had seen such a smile before, when Retok witnessed the execution of disloyal Abarian subjects. The smile hardened on Retok's face, as if it had frozen there in the cold Nadian wind. "'Dismount your steed,' he said in a soft voice, which only Hultax heard. Trembling, Hultax obeyed his master's command. His stad, suddenly riderless, pawed nervously at the frost-hardened ground on the edge of the stream. Retok withdrew his whip-sword and fondled the jewel-encrusted haft. If you ever say that again, here, in Nadia, or elsewhere, I will kill you, he warned his lieutenant. But the brown girl, the brown girl be damned, roared Retok in sudden fury. We haven't been able to find her. That day at the cave, she came rushing out, Lord, while you— I was detained, Retok said, some of the passion gone from his voice. He would never forget the sight of the iron-thewed young man, who once had almost strangled him, growing suddenly incredibly transparent, then disappearing. He had stood there, whip-sword in hand, mouth agape, while the brown girl ran past him, and, according to what Hultax had told him later, mounted his own stad and vanished across the Ophridian plain. "'But, Lord, don't you see?' Hultax demanded. The brown girl knows what happened to Jomek, prince of the royal Nadian blood. If she attends the royal funeral, she will— Retok laughed. Hultax blanched. He had heard such laughter when enemies of Retok and thus of Aberia had died in pain. Fool, fool, he heard Retok say now. Think you a bedraggled wayfaring maid of the Ophridian desert will be invited to the funeral of a prince of the Nadian royal blood? Nevertheless, sir, Haltax persisted, that day at the cave I took the liberty to send three of our best stadsmen after the girl, with orders to capture her or kill her on sight. Slowly, as a thaw spreads in spring over the broad Nadian ice fields, Retox smiled at his second in command. Haltax, too, let his face relax into a grateful grin. Until now, he had been teetering on the brink of violent death, and he knew it. "'You may mount,' Retok said. Hastily, Haltax climbed astride his stad. Retok lifted his arm overhead and made a circular motion with his outstretched hand. The first of the Iberian stads advanced with some reluctance into the swift, cold, shallow water of the stream. "'What about the white giant?' Hultax asked unwisely when the entire party had reached the other side and Retok was urging his stad up the slippery bank. "'Have your scouts been able to find the wayfarers who saw him?' "'No, sire. Only the girl nursed him back to health. The others fled.' 
and wisely. They have learned to hold their tongues, as you should learn, Haltax. They will give us no trouble. As far as they are concerned, there is no white giant. But there is talk of what happened at the tower, and of Portok's wizardry, and a god who would return, full-grown, in exactly a hundred years. Shut up! Retok cried, almost screaming the words. But that night at the Iberian encampment, a day and a half's march from Nadia City, Retok dreamed of Queen Avala, the lovely Ophridian ruler, whose slow death by torture he had relished as the final act of his utter destruction of the once proud Ophridian nation. Ivala in the dream seemed happy and confident. Retok awoke sweating, although frigid winds howled over the Nadian ice fields. Her confidence sent unknown fear through him. Really, it's quite simple, the superbly muscled prisoner said in the language which was not his own, but which he could speak as well as a native. You see, it wasn't simple at all until I saw what was in the package. But it's quite simple now. In the package was a picture of my mother, the dead Queen Avala. I am her son. I am of the royal blood. When I saw the picture, it suddenly triggered my memory responses, as Portox had arranged. Then— What about the old guy in the well? the trooper asked unimaginatively. I'm sorry. I can't answer your questions now. I have to return to my home. The handful of wayfarers, who alone are left of a once great nation, are waiting for vengeance. I will— His voice trailed on, earnestly, politely. The trooper looked at the man from the state mental hospital, who shook his head slowly. They left the powerful, polite prisoner in his cell and went through the corridor to the prison office. Real weirdy, huh, Doc? the trooper said. Uh, um, weirdy to you, but rather cut and dry to me, I'm afraid, Dr. Slonum said. Delusions of grandeur and delusions of persecution. Advanced paranoia, I'm afraid. It's funny, Doc. When they took everything away from him he might hurt himself with, he didn't mind at all. Only the bracelet. Three strong men had to hold him when they took the bracelet. Bracelet? Dr. Slonum said. We got it in the office. I'll show you. The bracelet turned out to be a small, mesh metal strap as wide around as a big man's upper arm. Attached to the strap was a disc of silvery metal. You'd think it was worth a million bucks, the trooper said. Dr. Slonum nodded sagely. Paranoid. It helps confirm the diagnosis. You see, out of touch with the real world, a paranoid can attach great value to utterly worthless objects. Well, I'll write out my report, Sergeant. Captain Carruthers said to thank you, sir. Not at all. Part of my job. Meanwhile, back in his cell, the prisoner, big hands gripping the bars so tight that his knuckles were white, was thinking, I've got to make them understand. Somehow I've got to make them understand before it's too late. He closed his eyes, lost in intense thought. When he did so, an image swam before his mind's eye. He did not know how this could be, but ascribed it to more of the dead Portox magic. What he saw was the barren ice fields of Nadia, with several great caravans making their slow way across the bleak, blazing whiteness toward Nadia City. As was the custom in Nadia, the prisoner, whose name was Bram Forrest, knew great funeral games would be held to honor the memory of the late beloved Prince Jlomak. And it was here, in frigid Nadia, at such a time as this, when all the royal blood of all the royal households of Tarth gathered. The wizardry of Portok seemed to tell him that vengeance would come. Here, if only... Ilya! The image blurred. He had seen her once. His knuckles went white as bleached bone on the bars. He concentrated every atom of his will. Ilya! Ilya! But now, with his eyes shut, he saw nothing. With his eyes opened, 
only the bars of his cell and the cell-block corridor beyond. Ilya, Ilya, hear me. There is danger on the road to Nadia. Ilya. End of chapter 10